Good afternoon, Europe. Uh, good morning uh, to those who have joined us across the ocean. Good evening, Central Asia. It's a big privilege for me to welcome you to the second day of the Alliance Conference on behalf of Special Representative Valiant Ricci. Uh, a short technical announcement before we pass on to panel two of the conference. The speaker list for the floor interventions for this panel has been closed, but there's still an opportunity for those who participate in the conference to register for the interventions from the floor for panel three and panel four. You can do it online, uh, sending a request to the floor request, or you can do it in person, addressing my colleague Evan Carr, who is sitting right behind. Let me introduce the moderator of today's panel. Uh, this is Katerina Lukova. She is at interim head of asylum and migration sector of the EU, EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, FRA, and she has been working with FRA since 2017. Uh, Katerina's areas of expertise uh, include fundamental rights advice in the implementation of the hotspot approach, migration, vulnerable groups, and border management. She has previously worked for IOM, covering the areas of migration and border management, where she was involved in project development and management, as well as monitoring and evaluation. During the migration crisis, Katarina was on frequent field missions to the Western Balkans, where she was involved in various research and capacity building activities with a focus on countering migrant smuggling, trafficking in human beings, and on human rights standards in migration detention. She has contributed to several publications and assessments which focus on irregular migration. Over to you, Katarina. Thank you very much, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to the panel two of uh, the Conference of Alliance. Uh, this panel uh, will focus on ensuring protection to all victims, with the big stress on the word all. The principle of non-discrimination is the basis for effective protection of all victims of trafficking in human beings. This principle guarantees the access to remedies for all traffic persons, actually irrespective of their age, citizenship, social, economic, cultural, ethnic or religious background. However, as uh, was observed in practice, protection efforts are often undermined by already pre-established categories of victims, as well as influenced by previous identification patterns. Now in this panel, in panel two, we will look into the opportunities and explore them, how to strengthen uh, our protection mechanisms and approaches and develop assistance that meets the individual needs and specific vulnerabilities of all victims. This panel discussion will focus on the needs of the victims who often remain overlooked or undetected, or for whom the protection responses still need to be developed. This includes national minorities, people on the move, including those seeking refuge from armed conflicts, people with disabilities, as well as take into account the gender-specific vulnerabilities. This discussion, I find, is very timely, as the numbers of people displaced into the EU member states, as one where we are sitting today, Austria, are the highest since the Second World War. There are 6.5 million of uh, internally displaced people in Ukraine, and out of them, approximately 2.5 million are children. Around 4 million people fled from Ukraine to the different countries in the EU. Most of, most of these people are women and children. Though there have so far not been uh, many or any, I mean, my uh, point of uh, information is last Friday where I was informed there were no confirmed cases of trafficking in human beings in the EU, there are several investigations already ongoing. Let me update you perhaps on the main steps uh, taken by the Fundamental Rights Agency in this regard. We have carried out missions to the four member states neighboring Ukraine, to Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania, and focused on the situation 
um, of the people fleeing uh, the war in Ukraine. One of the risks that we have seen is the risks posed uh, in terms of trafficking in human beings, stemming out of the wide uh, flow of people arriving and, um, and uh, the huge assistance being provided. Uh, we have produced a short report that you can find also on our website and there will be more reports following up. Let me also update you on the main steps uh, taken at the EU level to prevent trafficking of those fleeing Ukraine. The Commission has presented operational guidelines on implementation of temporary protection directive, which has one section focusing on trafficking. There is also a 10-point action plan for stronger European coordination on welcoming people fleeing the war in Ukraine. In this plan, it is also envisaged that the EU anti-trafficking coordinator works with member states and the EU agencies, including FRA, on developing a shared anti-trafficking plan to address risks of trafficking and support potential victims. The EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, which I represent here, provides assistance and expertise to the EU institutions, member states, but also EU agencies. We do it through production of quantitative, but also qualitative research, but also through frequent visits to the border areas so that we do not remain somewhere sitting in the silo. FRA is also part of the Justice and Home Affairs Agencies Network of the EU, participating regularly in the meetings led by the EU anti-trafficking coordinators. Among FRA's focus areas is also trafficking in human beings, and our agency has especially focused on the issue of child victims and victims of se severe labor exploitation. One of FRA's reports focused, for example, on one category of victims which often remains undetected. It's migrant women exploited in domestic work. And I will gladly, if you are interested, share with you more information. But now, without further ado, let me introduce the first speaker, Ms. Heather Comenda, who is a counter-trafficking professional with 20 years of experience in protection and assistance. She, she joined IOM in 2004 and has worked in Southeast Asia, East Africa, and the Horn, the Middle East, and uh, North Africa, in IOM headquarters in Switzerland, and currently is the Senior Regional Thematic Specialist for Migration for Migrant Protection and Assistance in IOM's regional office in Vienna. She holds a Master of Arts degree in Political Science from McGill University and Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science from the University of Manitoba. So now the floor is yours. Over to you, Heather. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Perfect. Um, so today I would like to introduce you to IOM's determinants of migrant vulnerability model and explain how this can be applied to improve our protection and assistance uh, to all victims of trafficking with a particular focus on migrant vulnerabilities. Um, so this vulnerabilities approach grew directly out of IOM's work with victims of trafficking. So very often having access to this population has exposed us to other migrants who have experienced other forms of violence, exploitation and abuse. Um, I can just leave it on. I don't have services. So our purpose in developing this model was to make the case um, that there are other forms of harm that affect migrants and migrants who have experienced those types of harm are equally deserving of protection and assistance services. However, I want to be very clear that we very much acknowledge um, that human trafficking is a specific crime and that specific measures are required to combat that crime. And it is our hope that this vulnerabilities-based approach can contribute to that. So what this approach is, is it is an ecological approach that looks at individual, household or family, community, and structural level risk and protective factors. Now, the thinking behind this is that traditionally when identifying and assisting individuals who have been trafficked, much of the effort focused on responding to their individual needs and understanding their individual vulnerabilities. As trafficking in persons is a crime against individuals, this is of course appropriate. But what we aim to do with this model is to make the point that individuals are embedded in broader social structures. 
This includes interpersonal relationships, such as those in the household and family, but also within the community and more broadly within society. And typically a focus solely on individual vulnerabilities often looks at individual deficits, um, a lack of income opportunities, a lack of, in, of education, uh, a lack of appropriate coping strategies. While this is important for designing effective responses, it ignores uh, the roles of families, perhaps in perpetrating or protecting against harm. It also does not take into account how interactions between different groups within communities um, impacts vulnerability and how community level factors, for example, intercommunal violence, uh, social beliefs and practices can shape an environment that is more or less conducive to human trafficking. We also aim to explicitly recognize that individuals are not merely a bundle of vulnerabilities and deficits. Individuals, households, communities, and societies do have protective factors, or they do have ways to mitigate against the harms and the potential for human trafficking. So this model aims to outline and provide a structured way of looking at the crime of human trafficking as something that is the result, the exposure to potential harms and the inadequate level of protection against those harms, and that it is the sum total of those risk and protective factors that leads to vulnerability to trafficking or other forms of harms. By using this approach, then, when we speak of a vulnerabilities-based approach, it allows us and it facilitates a structured analysis, and it also forces us to think more broadly beyond the individual and their individual circumstances and the roles that the people in their lives and their communities and their governments have to play in addressing vulnerabilities. Ideally, this model will have a predictive value. So typically when we interact with victims of trafficking, it is after they have been identified and after they have already faced harms. You, by using this model, our aim uh, and our hope is that by developing a very comprehensive understanding of multiple varia variables, we will be able to identify communities and individuals who would be more at risk of experiencing such harms within a migration context ideally prior to them embarking on a migration project so that we can counsel them, uh, direct them to appropriate services, and ideally undertake interventions prior to the experience of harm. This model is accompanied by an assistance to vulnerable migrants framework. And here I think the main contribution is when we talk about whole of society and whole of government approaches to human trafficking, we need to think through what this actually means. And the assistance to vulnerable migrants framework takes the knowledge we have learned from our vulnerability assessment and aims to design interventions that respond to the key vulnerabilities identified. So in a typical case of trafficking, we are likely to see variables at all different levels. So we are likely to see indeed some deficits or specific risks uh, at the individual level, but we are likely to also see a family that perhaps was not activating potential protection mechanisms, communities that were not supporting uh, at-risk, marginalized, racialized communities, and perhaps laws, policies, and programs that did not adequately intervene or protect vulnerable persons. So by breaking this down, we understand what specific actions can be taken and very importantly, by whom. So when we think about risks at the individual and family level, we think about case managers, counselors, educators, local authorities who interact face to face with people at risk of trafficking or people who have been trafficked. And these are the people who can design individual and family level responses. So I think we're all familiar with the needs that most victims of trafficking have at the individual level. Counseling, access to protection pathways, um, support in recovery, income generation, uh, opportunities, etc. But also at the household, this can be counseling, um, an analysis of the family dynamics to see what protective capacities exist within a family, but also what supporting needs uh, families may have to both prevent and respond to trafficking that affects their family. And of course, this would be critically important in the case of trafficking in children. 
more broadly at the community level, then we start to see the role of community leaders and local development um, and representatives at the state at the community level. Because when we think about individuals and families, their interaction with the state is typically at the community level. So here when we see community factors, so for example, um, you know, presence of interpersonal violence, intercommunal violence, or less related things in theory, um, such as environmental degradation and climate change, it is local actors who can work with communities to mitigate against these potential push factors into unsafe, irregular migration and potentially victims of tra uh, trafficking situations. And finally, of course, at the structural level, we see the role of policymakers, governments, um, development partners, et cetera. And by taking it apart and looking at it through all of these component parts, we believe this can help us identify all of the vulnerabilities that need to be addressed and all of the sectors of society and government that can be mobilized to address these vulnerabilities. In my last slide, um, how do we deploy this in our operations? And I should be very clear that this is our operations in support of governments and our work with governments and states in addressing vulnerabilities. So first, um, expanding protection pathways. So as I mentioned, very often we might work with migrants specifically um, who have experienced harms that we cannot identify as trafficking. There may be a constituent element missing, or we may not have or the actor responding may not have the capacity to do an identification. It may be only a specific actor who does the identification and in some circumstances um, there is more or less inclusivity uh, in who is allowed into that category. Um, but the protection pathways can be used to extend protections and social protections to all manner of persons who require that assistance. Uh, secondly, in return operations, we have become much more engaged in conducting and mainstreaming vulnerability assessments together with our partners so that at any stage in a migration cycle or a migration project, any migrant, ideally who comes into contact with us or our partners or member states will have the opportunity to have their vulnerabilities identified and access to appropriate referral pathways. Very important identifying vulnerabilities within transit and high flow contexts. This uh, remains a very challenging situation. So our typical IOM casework with victims of trafficking is very intensive social protection work, lots of interviews, lots of opportunities to gather information and get a good comprehensive understanding of somebody's situations and vulnerabilities. In transit and high flow context, this becomes very challenging. Um, and there remains quite a lot of work to do in pre-identifying potential vulnerability factors, because of course these factors vary from context to context, so that we can improve our targeting of screening um, with the view towards improved identification and referral of victims of trafficking. And finally, and critically important uh, in these times is addressing vulnerabilities and trafficking in times of crisis. So we see, of course, a broad range of vulnerabilities, um, exposure to violence, uh, exposure to conflict, of course, increases vulnerability to a wide variety of harms. And we've been very active in working with our partners in addressing that uh, in the crisis in the context right now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. This was a very, uh, very uh, good overview of the IOM holistic approach, a vulnerabilities based uh, approach, and also your work with governments, how you are taking it on. Um, I thank you very much. And now I would like to pass the floor to the next speaker, to Ms. Liliana Palihovici. Uh, Ms. Uh, Liliana Palihovici is the special representative of the OSCE, chairperson in Office on Gender. She is the president of the Institutum Virtutes Civilis, public association based in Chisinau, Moldova. She's active in promoting participative democracy, advancing policies in the field of human rights and gender equality, good governance and civil society development. She's a former MP and served as deputy speaker of parliament of the Republic of Moldova from 2010 to May 2017. From April 25th to May 30th, 2013, she held the position of interim president of the Parliament of the Republic of Moldova. She was a member of the Standing Committee for National Security, Defense and Public Order, and proudly served as the head of the national delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe 
and Vice President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. As of 2019, she's a member of the UN Women Europe and Central Asia Regional Civil Society Advisory Group. Ms. Palihovici has a master's degree in law and international relations. Ms. Palihovici, the floor is yours. Thank you. Honorable audience, good afternoon, and I thank you for the opportunity to participate in these discussions. And following the conclusions of the yesterday panel, we uh, have to mention that much has been invested in the recent years in co counteracting trafficking in human beings. It is important to note that most OEC member states have greatly improved their legislative uh, framework in the recent years and have developed internal monitoring mechanisms to prevent trafficking in human beings while strengthening the capacities of the institutions working with victims of trafficking in the meantime. Cross-border cooperation has been improved to combat uh, human trafficking, with increasingly more states diversifying their data collection tools. Nonetheless, we cannot imply that traffic prevention actions, as well as victim protection interventions, are without fault and guarantee the safety of all people in our region. Despite all efforts, we still record an alarming number of trafficking cases, which include victims of different ages, sexes, ethnicities, different levels of education and social status. By analyzing the causes be behind the large number of trafficking victims, we find that the speed of so-called innovations in the methods of recruitment used by trafficking networks is significantly higher than the pace at which the governmental institutions enhance their prevention and protection mechanisms for victims. It is obvious that traffickers' networks explode the existing vulnerabilities in prevention mechanisms. To be ahead of traffickers, we need to strengthen the protection mechanisms and diversify the approaches applied in analyzing the trafficking in human being cases while developing assistance that meets individual needs of the victims and addresses the specific vulnerabilities of each. The linear approach when tackling trafficking risks and the, uh, uh, initia um, and the initiation of the interventions based of exclusively on the profile of the ideal victim to which national protection systems grew accustomed to is outdated to say at least. The realities of the times we live in show that without a specific approach which emerges from the particularities of each specific case that includes also gender, we will not significantly increase the efficiency and impact of our interventions. At the same time, to achieve better results in combating trafficking in human beings, we must not only rely on the interventions of the governmental agencies with a specific mandate in these areas. Interventions uh, should, uh, we, we, we rather uh, have to act more extensively by ensuring that implemented public policies strengthen the rule of law, encourage women and men participation in decision making, and empower them economically and financially. It is important to make this message very clear for everyone, especially for those who have the power to adjust the reality in which population lives. The structural barriers that further facilitate the gender-based discrimination and certain inequalities are generating a constant increase in the number of humans that are being trafficked, affecting both women and men. To put an end to this cyclical phenomenon, we must ensure the free access for women to the job market, access to qualitative education, including uh, vocational education and training, eliminate all legislative barriers that are facilitating the discrimination of women in the recruitment, ensure the equal payment for equal uh, work, and create an environment where men and women share the household and childcare responsibilities. When we consider possible interventions that should contribute to the reduction of human trafficking, we have to acknowledge that an important factor that generates trafficking risks are also the persistent gender roles and stereotypes, which dictate certain behaviors of women and men. With this, 
um, in mind, it is important to ensure that information and the education campaigns do not further promote gender stereotypes and deepen the image of ideal victim. This will make the process of identifying and protecting victims of trafficking much more difficult. Therefore, it is essential to develop campaigns that do include gender issues that are often uh, overlooked in the awareness campaigns. Developing comprehensive gender sensitive pre prevention, protection and prosecution stages, it is of extreme importance to ensure that no victim is left behind. In the context of the new challenges to the security in our region, new risks to the personal security of different groups of population arise. For, diminish, for diminishing the risk of trafficking for both women and men, the OEC participating countries, as well as to all the refugee receiving countries, to follow the recommendation of the OEC special representative uh, um, and coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings, and to ensure that national laws and regulations are updated to provide clear and comprehensive guidance regarding access to people seeking refuge, to temporary uh, uh, residence permit, medical insurance, health care. Also, um, provide information in the language that uh, uh, they understand, including through uh, unrestricted uh, access to mobile communication and internet resources. It's important also to create new opportunities for them uh, to be employed and to receive some, um, uh, um, some salaries and uh, also to support them, uh, especially uh, um, uh, women and children uh, that are seeking refugees to have access and to obtain an uh, identity document because there are so many cases when women of children are uh, traveling with temporary documents or with no documents. Um, also for high importance uh, for each country that is receiving refugees is to organize also informational campaign and to help them to understand which are the uh, risks for human trafficking. We have also to keep in mind that women living in conflict-affected regions are even more susceptible to risk of human trafficking. Such circumstances can be observed in Ukraine where the armed conflict is posing high risk to the personal security of more than 4 million of Ukrainian people who have been forced to live, leave their country and also even to more millions of people that are internally displaced. I have spoken to several non-governmental organizations in Ukraine which even in such hostile conditions continue to monitor cases of violence and abuse against women and continue gathering evidence to document them. They warn of several cases of, of people disappearances, abductions and the fact that fu fundamental rights are under threat. Undoubtedly, their mission is essential and must be assisted by all of us so we can act in accordance with the infringements recorded on the territory of Ukraine and not only. There were several cases recorded also, as I have mentioned, of uh, uh, um, women and children uh, uh, crossing borders without documents. Um, the, there are also reports of dubious offer to help uh, for refugee women. A crisis of such magnitude puts increased pressure on the border police of Ukraine and uh, also countries uh, on police, um, uh, border police of countries um, such as Moldova, Poland, Poland, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and requires a combined international effort to ensure that people who have lost their homes and often their family members are not at risk to be abused of any human trafficking networks. In this context, increased assistance to Ukraine it is necessary for monitoring the current situation so the international community can take uh, swift action to ensure there is no room for traffickers both inside or outside Ukraine. At the same time, increased assistance needs to be directed towards neighboring countries to monitor the safe movement of Ukrainian refugees and minimize trafficking risks. It is worth noting that the capabilities of non-profit organizations specialized in the field are not neglected and must uh, be uh, seen as an asset 
that can be further employed to ameliorate the current threats. Therefore, it is necessary to allocate additional funds to support their work both in Ukraine and neighboring countries to provide safe solutions for uh, the uh, stay and transit of the refugees. I hope that today's discussions and the, uh, our work in the next months will help us to save the life of millions of people and to make our, uh, uh, the security in our uh, region stronger. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Palihovici, for, uh, for stressing the need to diversify the approach and to make it a gender sensitive approach, also for addressing vulnerabilities of each and every person, and also for strengthening the need of public policies empowering both men and women, and also for your suggestions related to the current humanitarian crisis. Now I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Fernande uh, Varenes, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on minority issues since 2017. As part of his mandate, he is the reference point at the United Nations on the protection of the human rights of national or ethnic, religious and linguistic minorities. He is also a junk professor at the National University of Ireland, Galway, visiting professor at the Université Catholique de Lyon in France and visiting professor at Vitautas Magnus University in Lithuania. He is renowned as one of the world's leading experts on the international human rights of minorities. Dr. De Verenes' research and publications record spans over 200 publications in more than 30 languages. In recognition of his work and achievements in the field of human rights and the protection of minorities, he has received accolades from Africa, Asia and Europe, including the 2021 prize of the Federalist Union of European Nationalities, the 2004 Liga Pa Award from Barcelona, Spain, and the Knight's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland, and Tip O'Neill Peace Fellowship from Northern Ireland, UK. Mr. Fernandez Varenes, the floor is yours. Vielen Dank, Katarina. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and panelists, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour tout le monde. Grüß Gott. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, recently warned that for predators and human traffickers, the war in the Ukraine is not a tragedy, it's an opportunity, and women and children are the targets. For trafficking rings notoriously active in Ukraine and neighboring countries in peacetime, the fog of war is perfect cover to increase business. This afternoon's panel is entitled Ensuring Protection to All Victims. And implied in those few words is the need for clarity as to whom are the victims. And here, unfortunately, it's not only the fog of war which may obscure matters sometimes. Many, perhaps most, victims of trafficking are from minority and other vulnerable groups, especially women and children from these communities. Human traffickers target and exploit for sexual labor and other purposes, those who are most vulnerable and periods of war and instability exacerbate those who socially, economically or legally are at the lowest, most disadvantaged or marginalized rungs of society. We all know who they are, but it hasn't necessarily clicked where they tend to be women, children, and workers from mainly minority backgrounds, in part because they're not always acknowledged as minorities. Who among those who are the most marginalized and disadvantaged are they in Europe? Migrants and refugees, Romas and people of color, those from South Asia or the Middle East or Africa who may also be fleeing conflicts, but who are deemed as well, let's call them others. Those who are stateless also, who have no citizenship or who do not have the required legal or identi identity documentation as we've heard previously. Those who because of their, well, sometimes language or education are less able to defend themselves. In practical terms, these are often disproportionately minorities. This brings me to the point to point out the, the great care we need to take in relation to how we 
conceptualize and address human trafficking in the European context. If you look again, even at the description of this panel in the official conference program, it mentions the importance of effective protection of tra trafficking victims, um, with uh, persons who by ensuring access to remedies for all traffic persons, irrespective of their age, gender, citizenship, and social, economic, cultural, ethnic, or religious background. Unfortunately, this omits the background, one of the backgrounds, one of the greatest barriers to ensuring access to remedies, and that is language. It's actually not there. Those who are displaced and disoriented, often with no idea where to go next, need to be reached as effectively as possible. And that means through their own language. If you read also the panel description more closely, it then goes on to emphasize uh, the following, and I quote, on the needs of the victims who often remain overlooked or for whom the protection response still needs to be developed, including national minorities, end of quote. Let's be clear. Most of those who are most in need of protection are not necessarily national minorities in the European sense, but members of ethnic, linguistic, or linguistic minorities. Not the same concept, not the same thing. These are the groups who may be, they may not be national minorities, but they are still particularly vulnerable and marginalized. In her 2010 report on trafficking in persons, especially women and children, my colleague, the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, points out uh, on the need to adopt inclusive and inclusive approach in preventing human trafficking. And she highlighted that minorities are among the groups at high risk of being trafficked because of the wide range of intertwined factors at play. What, there's not a single factor one single factor such as poverty, gender, discrimination, or lack of employment opportunities per se does not necessarily lead to trafficking. Rather, it is the combination of multiple factors that may, play, that may place certain individuals, usually mainly minorities, by the way, at the high risk of being trafficked. Thus, my colleague argued that measures aimed at addressing the root causes of trafficking should be based on the recognition that trafficking is caused by a lack of comprehensive protection of human rights for all, and I would add particularly minorities. Another important observation to return to the issue of language is that from the field experiences, uh, in, uh, from the field experiences, translation and language support has been one of the most troubling and inadequately provided services to the victims of trafficking who are again, quite often, I would even say, usually minorities. Yet it's crucial in the rehabilitation and reintegration of victims and in their access to justice. <sighs> times of conflict, such as we're now experiencing, can at times serve as lens that magnifies some of the darker sides of our humanity. Yet it's during these periods that more needs to be done to better protect those who are most vulnerable and in need of protection. I wish I didn't have to remind us of what is happening to some minorities. You may have heard, for example, about some fleeing the conflict who find themselves at the back of the line, receiving less assistance because of their, well, the color of their skin or their obvious ethnic origins. You may have heard that there is a government minister of a member state of the European Union loudly declare in a media interview that not a single Muslim would be admitted in the country due to the conflict in Ukraine. And Roma who have await, availed themselves of the open borders of some neighboring countries are now finding themselves in ethnically segregated reception centers with poor living conditions and even less food than others are receiving. Think about that for a moment. These discriminatory treatment of Roma and other minorities make them even more vulnerable during this extremely difficult period and thus more vulnerable to human trafficking. To conclude, it may be useful to remember that we've been here before. 
in 1939, the MS St. Louis, a ship with around 900 Jewish passengers, was refused landing by Cuba, Canada, and the United States in the lead up to the Holocaust. They, as members of the Jewish minority in Nazi Germany, faced harassment, discrimination, and worse. For many, that rejection was a death sentence. They were turned back, well, because of their religion and ethnic origins during a period of our history where anti-Semitism and prejudice against minorities, such as themselves, but also against others around the world, Roma, Dalits, Africans, and Asians was widespread and even almost prevalent in a number of countries. In a declaration I issued last week or a few weeks ago, I stated that all people of Ukraine, including people with different origins, even, for example, from African, Asian, Middle Eastern descent and Roma, must be granted equal protection and safety when seeking refuge inside and outside of the country regardless of their ethnicity, religion, language, or status. Minorities such as Roma or people of African descent, those of Middle East or Asian origins, and all other minorities, regardless of the color of their skin or their ethnicity or religion, must all be dealt with without discrimination along their evacuation route. Many of you, many governments and populations here in Europe must be commended for the waves of generosity in opening your, their borders, their homes, their homes, and their hearts to many of the more, the, well, the many millions current, currently having fled war in Ukraine. But there's also a wider context which must be confronted. Those fleeing conflicts in Afghanistan, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Mali, Myanmar, Yemen, and other parts of the world also deserve to be treated with equality, generosity, and humanity, and should not be pushed away, like were minority Jews on the St. Louis in 1939, sometimes today to their death on the shores of the Mediterranean or of the English Channel. Because, well, because of the color of their skin, the God to which they pray, or the sound of their voices. They are minorities, but they are deserving to the full and complete protection, despite their, universe, their, their vulnerability. We should remember the promises that have been made by many in the past and today. Never again, plus jamais, nunca más. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. De Verenes. Thank you very much also for highlighting uh, the issues and the situation of the marginalized groups of the minorities and highlighting that these people might be less able to defend themselves and therefore also stressing the need for language and translation support to these groups and highlighting also the issue with uh, regard to the current humanitarian situation of equal protection and safety regardless uh, of, of, uh, of the background. So thank you very much for this. And now I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Shachnosa Kasanova, who is the director of the Legal Center for Women's Initiatives, Sana Sezim, in Kazakhstan. She possesses over 10 years of experience in the field of human rights protection, managing projects on combating human trafficking, preventing domestic violence, as well as protecting the rights of migrant workers and their families. She is a member of the Human Rights Commission under the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the Advisory Council under the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Republic of Kazakhstan, as well as of several international networks such as ECPAT, International and PICUM. Shaknosa is the hero of the 2021 U.S. Department of State Trafficking in Persons report. Ms. Kasanova, over to you. The floor is yours. Спасибо, госпожа модератор. Добрый день, уважаемые участники конференции. В первую очередь, позвольте выразить благодарность ОБСЕ за организацию и предоставленную возможность сегодня поделиться практическим опытом неправительственной организации «Санасизм», 
в области защиты прав жертв торговли людьми и непосредственное обеспечение доступа ко всем защитам, средствам всех жертв торговли людьми с учетом индивидуальных потребностей и конкретных факторов уязвимости. Как нам известно, торговля людьми по своей самой природе остается одним из самых замаскированных и замалчиваемых преступлений. И, как правило, жертвы таких преступлений не могут рассказать о, случившихся, о случившемся простым языком, тем более по лермским протоколам или языком своей страны. Несмотря на то, что сегодня Казахстаном предпринимаются необходимые меры в искоренении данного явления, динамика торговли людьми остается сложной и охватывает широкий спектр проявлений. Стигма и дискриминация в отношении людей с инвалидностью остаются серьезной проблемой, увеличивая риск торговли людьми. Лица с ограниченными возможностями по состоянию здоровья попадают в группу риска и могут подвергаться особому риску торговли людьми, эксплуатации в целях принудительного труда, попрошайничества, либо сексуальной эксплуатации. Хочу отметить, что первоначально разработанные модели помощи организации ориентировались на предполагаемый образ типичной жертвы торговли людьми. То есть, когда женщина, девушка подвергается сексуальной эксплуатации, мужчина был продан с целью принудительного труда, дети с целью сексуальной эксплуатации, либо попрошайничества. Однако 20-летний опыт организации показал разнообразие и многообразие различных категорий жертв торговли людьми, которые включают в себя жертв с инвалидностью. И в этой связи мы увидели необходимость разработки соответствующей программы помощи, которая бы учитывали специфические потребности различных групп категорий, в том числе и людей с ограниченными возможностями. Жертвы торговли людьми с инвалидностью, которые подверглись целью принудительного труда или попрошайничества, не обязательно имеют такие же потребности в плане помощи, как и лица, ставшие объектом торговли людьми с целью сексуальной эксплуатации. Во время идентификации и оказания помощи Жертвам торговли людьми с инвалидностью сотрудники организации столкнулись с тем, что сами жертвы с инвалидностью указывали на то, что существующие структуры в учреждениях не всегда должным и достаточным образом могут учесть имеющихся у них потребностей. Следует отметить и то, что специализированной помощи в отношении более трудных категорий, таких как жертвы инвалиды, жертвы с поведенческими расстройствами, нередко попросту и нет. Такие категории требуют помощи, выходящей за рамки разработанной модели помощи, и следует уделить больше внимания тому, чтобы адаптировать услуги и помощь с учетом нужд таких потребностей и категорий, включая в том числе и формирование навыков собеседования с ними, соответствующие услуги и специально подготовленный персонал, как в государственных учреждениях, которые оказывают специальные услуги для жертв торговли людьми, так и в неправительственных организациях, которых специализируются в области противодействия торговли людьми. У нас в организации были случаи вовлечения сексуального рабства а, девушки-мигрантки с когнитивными, интеллектуальными и эмоциональными ограниченными возможностями. Более того, данный кейс нес в себе транснациональный характер, так как девушка являлась иностранной гражданкой. Обманным путем она была привезена в Казахстан и более 10 лет подвергалась сексуальной эксплуатации. Из-за полученного стресса у девушки обострились психологические нарушения. И только после этого эксплуататоры решили избавиться от нее, оставив просто-напросто на улице без документов без еды и без вещей. К нам обратилась психиатрическая больница, в которую она попала в последующем через неравнодушных людей и которые оказали ей помощь. Оказывая правовую помощь в документировании, сотрудники и юристы организации столкнулись с тем, что установление ее личности не подтверждались ее данные, которые предоставлялись в дальнейшем в генеральное консульство соседних стран. Благодаря членству международной сети по противодействию торговли людьми в Центральной Азии и сотрудничеству правоохранительными с правоохранительными органами, нам удалось выяснить верные данные личности жертвы и оказать в дальнейшем в получении сертификата на возвращение. Однако, как я уже отмечала, учитывая то, что это был транснациональный кейс, при возвращении жертвы на родину важно всегда оказывать содействие в сопровождении жертвы через пересечение границы. В этой связи работа социального работника организации и НПО партнеров из соседних стран очень важна для содействия в поиске родных жертв торговли людьми, в разъяснении сложившейся ситуации и посодействовать в дальнейшем возвращении и реабилитации на родину. Кроме того, в организации также у нас были случаи, когда мужчина был вовлечен в попрошайничество, попрошайничество у него были нарушены, нарушены опорно-двигательный аппарат, то есть с отсутствием некоторых частей тела. Данное обращение в организацию поступило от партнерской организации. Суть обращения заключалась в том, что в 2000-х годах 
мужчина разводится со своей супругой, супруга обманным путем продает дом и с двумя детьми уезжает на постоянное место жительства в другую страну. Таким образом, мужчина остается, остается на улице без крыши над головой и начинает работать. Работая на разных работах, на последней работе он получает производственную травму, после чего стал инвалидом и ему ампутировали ноги. В последующем, став неконкурентоспособным и ограниченно дееспособным, он потерял возможность работать. В дальнейшем он знакомится с молодой семьей, которая помогает ему предоставлять возможность жить вместе с ним. Он начал работать на них и заниматься попрошайничеством. Таким образом, он отдавал всю выручку этой семье за то, чтобы он проживал в их семье. После поступления обращения в организацию, конечно же, вместе с правоохранительными органами мы выехали по месту прописки этого мужчины. Вместе с сотрудниками мы выяснили, что со слов мужчины он проживает вместе с семьей, кушает за одним столом вместе с этой семьей также. Его полностью все устраивает. Документы, удостоверяющие личности, он имеет при себе. И заявление на привлечение их к ответственности по факту попрошайничества писать отказался. Эти два кейса, о которых я сейчас вам рассказала, как раз-таки показывает то, что в некоторых случаях поведение, проведение идентификации жертвы торговой людьми представляется нелегкой. И для оказания как раз-таки необходимой помощи очень важно идентифицировать и верно и, предоставить, и присвоить статус жертвы торговой людьми. Следующий пример, которым также я хотелось бы вам с вами поделиться, это когда более 10 лет парень с инвалидностью подвергался принудительному труду со стороны опекунов. Мальчик находился во вспомогательной школе-интернат для слабослышащих детей. И в детском возрасте его установила одна семья, которая в дальнейшем эксплуатировала его в области скотоводчества в отдаленном селе. У мальчика было врожденное нарушение разговорной речи, и он не мог внятно, понятно выражать свои мысли. Всю пенсию отбирали опекуны, он нормально, нормально не питался и проживал в антисанитарных условиях. Для защиты своих прав и законных интересов он, конечно же, не мог себе идентифицировать как жертву торговой людьми и обратиться в дальнейшем за помощью. В последующем, когда случайно прохожая женщина стала интересоваться парнем, которому на тот момент уже исполнилось 20 лет, заподозрила, что ему необходима помощь. Обратившись в организацию правоохранительные органы, парень был вызволен из рабства. Но при идентификации и коммуникации с жертвой сотрудники организации столкнулись с тем, что для беседы и дальнейшей идентификации в качестве жертвы торговой людьми необходимо привлечь специалиста, логопеда-психолога, который мог бы коммуницировать с парнем. В последующем при поиске специалиста мы обратили внимание, что, к большому сожалению, недостаточно специалистов, логопедов, психологов, именно обученных в области противодействия торговли людьми. Хочу отметить, что на этих примерах можно увидеть и понять, что Наличие разных нарушений у людей с инвалидностью и, соответственно, наличие разных потребностей влекут за собой применение на практике различных подходов, способов и различных видов помощи жертв торговой людьми при их вызволении, идентификации, реабилитации и реинтеграции. Необходим гибкий подход для того, чтобы учесть не только различия потребностей, связанных с идентификацией и оказанием помощи, но и различия в характеристиках жертв. Несмотря на то, что такие случаи немного и имеют место быть, мы должны оказывать содействия в обеспечении доступа к средствам защиты всех жертв торговли людьми с учетом индивидуальных потребностей и конкретных факторов уязвимости. Но для того, чтобы учесть это многообразие и сложность задачи, необходимо рассмотреть каждого конкретного случая в индивидуальном порядке и осуществление реагирования на индивидуальной основе. Более полное понимание относительно реже встречающихся форм торговли людьми и, следовательно, потребностей жертв может сыграть важную роль в обеспечении более эффективной работы с служб по противодействию торговли людьми. При этом не менее важной задачей является то, чтобы для более трудных случаев, которые были связаны именно с жертвами, с инвалидностью, была доступна специализированная помощь в государственных учреждениях и в сферах социальной защиты. В завершении своего выступления хочу отметить и еще раз напомнить вам, что все жертвы, независимо от уязвимого положения должны иметь возможность получать правовую, медицинскую, социальную и другую помощь. Благодарю за внимание.
thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Casanova, for your, uh, for your presentation, where you were also presenting some of the individual stories which uh, helped us also to bring us closer to the needs of these victims. Uh, thank you also for focusing on different disabilities from physical also to behavioral uh, disorders or emotional disabilities and uh, really showing us uh, the need for enhanced and specialized model of uh, assistance and also for the needs uh, of the first providers to have the adequate skills. Uh, thank you very much. This uh, closes uh, the panel discussion and now I would like to uh, open the floor for interventions. We have already received a list uh, for the intervention. I would like to kindly ask you uh, to keep your intervention to two minutes maximum if possible and I would like to give the floor to France on behalf of the EU delegation and the following speaker will, be, will then be Canada. So over to France. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. Avec votre permission, je passe la parole à la délégation de l'Union européenne. Thank you, merci. Thank you, moderator. The EU would like to thank all speakers for their contributions. We agree with much of what has been said, including the need to ensure access to remedies for all trafficked persons, irrespective of the age, gender, citizenship, and social, economic, cultural, ethnic, or religious background. We agree that ensuring support and protection to victims remains a challenge. Victims should not have to fear retaliation and secondary victimization during criminal proceedings. The EU aims to facilitate the integration and is allocating substantial funding to achieve this. Victims should be treated as right holders without prejudice or bias. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine puts the lives and safety of all civilians at risk. In conflict situations or situations of displacement, women and children are particularly vulnerable and it is of utmost importance to protect them against gender-based violence and trafficking and other forms of exploitation as required by international humanitarian law, a duty that falls in particular on the occupation forces. In reaction to the refugee crisis, the EU grants access to everyone fleeing Russia's aggression, regardless of their nationality, skin color or ethnicity. And in this context, the EU has triggered the Temporary Protection Directive, as was just described by Mrs. Lukhofer from the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. Those eligible for temporary protection will be able to stay in the EU for at least one year and will be given a residence permit and access to education, to the labor market and to health services. The EU has also created a central information platform for Ukrainian refugees with information on protection, education, healthcare, jobs and accommodation. This contains relevant advice on personal safety and security, aiming to eliminate risks of trafficking in human beings. It has also adopted operational guidelines for national authorities on uh, implementation of the Temporary Protection Directive, and these include guidance on prevention uh, and awareness raising, as well as for the connection with protection and assistance measures when concrete cases are detected. And we would have one question, if time to permits, one question to all speakers who would like to address this. Uh, the identification and detection of victims or potential victims of trafficking in migration flows remains a challenge and is even more difficult in a conflict situation. And we would like to ask uh, the panelists if they could elaborate more um, and share insight on how to improve identification and detection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to pass the floor to Canada and it will be followed by delegation from Romania. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Modératrice. Nous remercions aussi les panélistes pour leurs utiles présentations. La grande majorité des victimes de la traite des personnes identifiées au Canada sont des jeunes femmes canadiennes exploitées sexuellement. Celles-ci proviennent de groupes marginalisés, comme mentionné par plusieurs panélistes, tels que les communautés autochtones, les migrants et les nouveaux immigrants, les personnes LGBTI, les personnes handicapées, ou aussi des personnes qui vivent dans des situations à risque, par exemple les enfants et les jeunes dans le système de protection de l'enfance. Nous sommes toutefois conscientes et conscients que certaines victimes sont identifiées moins souvent que d'autres, comme les jeunes hommes et les garçons qui sont victimes et survivants de la traite des personnes à des fins d'exploitation sexuelle. 
Pour répondre efficacement à cette situation et comme souligné par les panélistes, il est essentiel d'intégrer les perspectives de genre et de diversité dans notre analyse. Nous devons identifier les victimes, les survivantes et les survivants issus de tous les groupes ciblés dans la communauté, indépendamment de leur expression de genre, de leur âge, de leur origine ethnique, de leur orientation sexuelle ou de leur handicap mental ou physique. Il faut leur fournir les services axés et centrés sur ces victimes, culturellement pertinents et qui prennent en compte leur traumatisme. Madame Moderator, Canada's National Strategy to Combat Human Trafficking was informed by a gender and diversity perspectives, as well as an assessment of disproportionate impacts on certain at-risk population. A standardized approach, uh, an analytical process that we call in Canada a gender-based analysis plus. Based on this analysis, Canada has been able to identify gaps in existing supports and has provided con and continues to provide culturally informed services. For example, the Government of Canada provides increased funding for community-led empowerment programs that provides holistic, trauma-informed, short-term and long-term services to help survivors regain their independence, reintegrate into their communities, and begin their healing and recovery process. Moreover, the Government of Canada will also establish a national case management standard for service providers organization with a special focus on at-risk groups, such as indigenous women and girls, at-risk youth, migrants, and also to ensure that victims have access to services that address their specific needs and assist them in their recovery and healing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to pass the floor to delegation from Romania, which will be followed by Ombudsperson from Ukraine. Thank you. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, Romania fully subscribes to the remarks made by the representative of the European Union, and I would like to add some comments on my national capacity. We would like to thank the special representative, Mr. Val Ricci, and his team for organizing this conference on a topic highly relevant in the current context marked by Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Romania's position of strong condemnation of Russia's military aggression was made clear on numerous occasions, and I want to reiterate it today. This military aggression has a huge impact over the lives of the citizens and the residents of Ukraine, including those forced to flee the country in search of refuge and safety. The Romanian authorities have developed a coordinated response to best manage the problems faced by refugees at all levels, including the concerns related to trafficking in human beings. Among the measures taken in line with the recommendation of uh, OAC Special Representative, I would like to highlight the following. A task force at decision-making level coordinated by the Prime Minister was established since the first day of the conflict. A second task force at operational level, led by head of Prime Minister Chancellery, was established to oversee the activities of the ministries involved. Thirdly, still at the level of the Prime Minister's office, was set up a group for strategic coordination of humanitarian assistance led by a state councillor. The government of Romania has established six working, group, working groups with the aim of elaborating inclusion and protection policies in the fields of health, education, employment, housing, vulnerable persons, youth, and children. Operational task forces were established in each of the 41 countries of Romania with the aim to uh, uh, rapidly identify the most adequate protection measures for unaccompanied minors. Several other legislative changes were made in order to ensure all the support the refugees may need in terms of access to health, education, labor market, and so on. An online platform with all relevant information has been made operational by the government with the support of civil society. Information materials such as flyers, brochures and posters in Ukrainian language, which contain emergency phone numbers, are distributed at border crossing points and asylum centers. This information are also available on websites and social media of all actors involved in the fight against human trafficking. The emergency lines 112 and 119 are now available in Ukrainian. A screening procedure is in operation at the border crossing points with Ukraine to help identify the risk of trafficking. 
The National Agency Against Trafficking in Persons carries out informative and training courses for civil servants who might interact with potential victims regarding their conduct in such situation. Madam Moderator, the fight against trafficking in human beings continues to represent a priority for the Romanian authorities. The identification at the earliest stage possible and the provision of the necessary support for all victims of trafficking represent a key principle of our anti-trafficking system. We thank the Special Representative of OSCE Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings for all the support provided, including in this current challenging context, and we look forward to continuing our cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to pass the floor to the Ombudsperson of Ukraine, who will connect via Zoom. It will be followed by delegation of Holy See. Уважаемые участники конференции, дамы и господа, хочу поблагодарить организаторов и участников конференции Альянса за подготовку к рассмотрению этой важной темы – защита обеспечения прав и усиление помощи. Особо актуальным эта тема звучит во время военной агрессии преступного режима Российской Федерации против гражданского населения Украины, что является грубым нарушением международного гуманитарного права. Каждый день Россия из так называемого высокоточного оружия обстреливает детские сады, школы, церкви, больницы, жилые дома, магазины и другие объекты гражданской инфраструктуры, целые мирные города и поселки. Российские оккупанты через обман, а чаще принудительно вывозят украинцев с временно оккупированных территорий Украины в Российскую Федерацию, как в свое время это делали нацисты во время Второй мировой войны. Граждан Украины заставляют пройти фильтрационные лагеря, отбирают деньги и все документы, затем отправляют в депрессивные районы Российской Федерации с предписаниями, запрещающими выезд из этих регионов в течение последующих двух лет. Что это, как ни одна из форм торговли людьми? Попытка таким образом получить дармовой человеческий ресурс для рабского принудительного труда и других худших форм торговли людьми – женщинами и детьми, милитаризации мужского населения возраста 18-65 лет в качестве пушечного мяса, не прошедшие фильтрацию участники гражданского сопротивления, ветераны войны, журналисты и просто граждане с активной проукраинской позицией подвергаются необоснованным преследованиям и в лучшем случае попадают, пополняют обменный фонд Российской Федерации или освобождаются при условии их выкупа. Весь мир стал свидетелем бучанской резни и других трагедий украинских городов и сел, мучеников, переживающих геноцид и российскую оккупацию. Все видят, какая роль уготована нашим мирным гражданам в системе координат русского мира. На горячую линию уполномоченной Верховной Рады Украины по правам человека ежедневно поступают сообщения об изнасиловании российскими оккупантами не только украинских женщин, но и детей 11-16 лет. Хочу напомнить, что такого рода военные преступления не имеют срока давности. Принудительное перемещение украинских граждан на территории Российской Федерации и Беларусь является нарушением норм международного права, Женевской конвенции прав и свобод человека и гражданина. По данным самой Российской Федерации, уже около полумиллиона граждан Украины после массового вторжения 24 февраля этого года вывезено из Украины в Россию. Прошу ОБСЕ исследовать этот вопиющий факт торговли людьми и применить все рычаги влияния с целью освобождения и возвращения этих граждан в Украину. Гуманитарная катастрофа в городах Украины, ежедневные обстрелы и бомбардировки Российской Федерации заставляют наших соотечественников покидать охваченную войной территорию в поисках защиты и помощи. За 40 дней вторжения более... Более 10 миллионов человек выехали из своих домов. Более 4 миллионов человек покинули страну. Подавляющее большинство – это женщины, дети и пожилые люди. Волна мигрантов из Украины в Европу стала крупнейшим миграционным вызовом со времен Второй мировой войны. И мы благодарим всех, все истинно братские народы за готовность и бескорыстность в помощи и сохранении будущего нашей страны. Вынужденная миграция в поисках безопасного убежища повышает риск 
попадания в ситуацию торговли людьми, особенно уязвимые женщины, дети и лица с инвалидностью, насильно вывезены в Российскую Федерацию и Беларусь. Попадание человека в ситуацию торговли людьми влечет за собой нарушение таких основополагающих прав человека, как право на жизнь, уважение, достоинства, свободу и личную неприкосновенность. В условиях войны России против Украины риск попадания людей в ситуацию торговли людьми возрастает в разы, поскольку убийство и торговля людьми – это часть государственной политики Российской Федерации. Призывая дружественные Украине страны сконцентрировать дополнительные усилия на недопущении нарушения Конвенции Совета Европы о мерах по противодействию торговле людьми и предоставить... Э, и предотвратить попадание граждан Украины в такую ситуацию. Создать международный трибунал по расследованию военных преступлений и геноциду Российской Федерации против гражданского населения в Украине. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, intervention. Now I would like to pass the floor uh, to the delegation of Holy See, and I would like to kindly ask uh, all to, to, if possible, to uh, limit their interventions to two minutes. Thank you very much. It will be then followed by the intervention of Russian Federation Prosecutor General Office. Thank you. Madam Moderator, welcoming, protecting, promoting, integrating, these are the words used by Pope Francis to emphasize the dignity of each person and the need to provide all migrants the care they deserve. People responsible for welcoming and accompanying victims of trafficking are needed to help those they work with to heal from this traumatic experience and regain agency over their lives. They ought to be trained to recognize and address the individual needs of victims and survivors. It's crucial that they create a safe environment in which the survivors feel safe enough not only to denounce the perpet perpetrators, but also to reveal illegal activities and fully address the violence they have suffered. Women and girls, are among the most vulnerable to this heinous crime, accounting for 72% of identified tracking victims. However, we also know that there are many women who have had the courage to rebel against violence. Addressing some victims, Pope Francis insisted, let us go forward in the struggle against human trafficking and every form of slavery and exploitation. I invite you all to keep your indignation alive, keep your indignation alive, and to find every day the strength to engage with determination on this front. Do not be afraid of the arrogance of violence, no, do not surrender to the corruption of money and power. Thank you all and keep going. Do not be discouraged. In times of financial and economic hardship, we are aware that some governments might be less likely to allocate additional funding to combat trafficking and protect victims. However, it's imperative to recognize that such funding is necessary to support public and private projects that protect, assist, and integrate victims and ensure national security. This is especially important given that victims are the main actors which help uncover criminal networks. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much. And now I would like to pass the floor to the Prosecutor General's Office of the Russian Federation, who will connect via Zoom, and it will be followed by delegation of Montenegro. So over to you. Добрый день, уважаемые участники конференции. На протяжении последних десяти лет я являюсь одним из экспертов-аналитиков Генеральной прокуратуры по вопросам противодействия торговли людьми и незаконной миграции. В России созданы условия для эффективного противодействия всем формам торговли людьми. Этому способствовало включение в национальное законодательство ратифицированных 
и норм международного права. Проводимый органами прокуратуры регулярный мониторинг правоприменительной практики свидетельствует, что чаще других проявлений трафикинга в России, как и в других частях Европы и мира, встречаются факты сексуальной эксплуатации женщин и детей. В прошедшем 2021 году такие преступления составили 99% от общего числа выявленных в сфере торговли людьми, более 3000. И при этом свыше 86% потерпевших от этих деяний – женщины, а 78% несовершенные, несовершеннолетние лица. К огромному сожалению, примерно одна шестая часть детей пострадала от преступных действий собственных родителей. В России в целях устранения условий совершения таких преступлений важное значение придается поддержке института семьи и профилактике домашнего насилия. Нужно отметить, что во всех территориальных органах полиции функционируют подразделения по делам несовершеннолетних. Национальное законодательство устанавливает несколько видов ответственности для лиц, допускающих жестокое обращение с ребенком. Уголовное наказание предусмотрено за все виды физического, сексуального и психического насилия над детьми. Отмечу, что для осуществления уголовного преследования за торговлю людьми и использования рабского труда не требуется обязательное согласие пострадавших лиц. Время доказывания лежит на государстве. Жертвы торговли людьми могут быть освобождены от уголовной ответственности, если совершали противоправные деяния в обстоятельствах крайней необходимости или физического принуждения. Полагаем, что для предотвращения распространения торговли людьми необходимы скоординированные меры по противодействию международной секс-индустрии женщин и детей в борьбе с организованными криминальными группировками. Прокуроры ежегодно добиваются блокировки сотен интернет-ресурсов, содержащих пропаганду проституции и порнографии с участием несовершеннолетних. Под постоянным контролем прокуратуры находятся вопросы соблюдения миграционного законодательства поскольку мигранты, и особенно нелегальные мигранты, становятся легкой добычей торговцев любви, людьми. Представляется важным продолжение контактов и сотрудничества государств в борьбе с торговлей людьми. Как эксперту для меня ценен формат встреч национальных координаторов и доплатчиков и обмен новыми практиками. Работа по укреплению связи в борьбе с торговлей людьми осуществляется нами не только в рамках ОБСЕ, но и на других международных площадках, в частности, в Шанскайской организации сотрудничества. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Now I would like to pass the floor to the delegation of Montenegro, and it will be followed by delegation of Ukraine. Thank you very much, and distinguished Ms. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an honor and pleasure to address you on behalf of the Montenegro and the Montenegro Ministry of Interior. Uh, and I will use this opportunity to thank the distinguished organizers, the Office of the OSC Special Representative and Coordinator for Combined Trafficking in Human Beings for the invitation to this 22nd Alliance Against Trafficking in Person Conference. I would like to underline that uh, the protection of human rights and combined trafficking in human beings as well as the constant upgrade of the already established systems and the adapting to new trends, trends and challenges in the manifestations of the trafficking in human beings phenomenon is one of our priority goals. We believe that the focus of all relevant actors within national structures aimed at combined THB should precisely be the vulnerability of a person seeking refuge that might be at risk of becoming prey to human trafficking. Therefore, we have received with due attention the recently adopted practical recommendation developed by the OSC Special Representative Office and in relation to whose implementation we will determine concrete steps in coming period that will upgrade our efforts in the field of identification of a potential victims among these persons seeking refuge. Our state policy against trafficking uh, in human beings is aimed at acting on strategic and operational level when it comes to combined trafficking in human beings, with a focus on proactive identification of potential victims of THB, as well as 
in part creating the best possible conditions for providing comprehensive protection of victims of trafficking in human beings. Identification is a basic precondition for access to protection mechanism de developed in our country. In this regard, the Ministry of Interior formed a team for formal identification of victims, which conducts certain SOPs that shifting the focus of formal identification of victims of trafficking for the, uh, from the aspect based on criminal procedures to the aspect based on human rights. Victim protection is provided in a licensed uh, uh, shelter financed by the state as well as uh, in accordance with the agreement on cooperation in the fight against trafficking in human beings signed between state bodies and NGOs. Individual plans for reintegration are creating for all uh, victims according to their needs. So due to respect uh, of the time limit, I will only conclude that Montenegro is oriented and committed to acting bilater bilaterally and multilaterally in the fight against trafficking in human beings and actively participating in the work of all international organizations and initiatives aimed at combat this form of crime. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to pass the floor now to the delegation of Ukraine, and it will be followed by the delegation of the USA. Thank you. At this very moment, while we are speaking, Russian armed forces are exterminating the civilian population of Ukraine. According to juvenile prosecutors, the Russian occupiers have killed 165 Ukrainian children since the beginning of the war and wounded another 266. It is because Russia started a full-fledged war in Ukraine, many people, in particular women and children, are forced to flee the country, trying to save their lives. They are seeking safety and refuge in Europe and are particularly at risk of human trafficking and exploitation. We are grateful to all our European partners who give the necessary assistance to Ukrainians, including at the border crossing points, providing them with the relevant comprehensive information about their rights and obligations abroad, warning them of the risks of accepting transportation and accommodation from strangers, informing how to seek help, and taking all other necessary measures to prevent trafficking in persons. Instead, Russia is forcibly relocating people from the cities that are being bombed by its army to its most remote regions. The goal is clear to use intimidated people by presenting them as saved by Russia for feeding Russian propaganda machinery and further fooling Russian society about the real course of Russia's actions in Ukraine. In real life, these people face threats, poverty, violence, and their words are distorted as coercion to slander Ukraine. Women and children are subjected to abuse, labor and sexual exploitation, trafficking and persons. According to the information information available, the Russian army has forcibly deported about 6,000 Mariupol residents to Russian filtration camps in order to use them as hostages and put more political pressure on Ukraine. As it was already mentioned by representative of the Ombudsman of Ukraine, afterwards those people are being redirected to northern parts of Russia. At the same time, the Russian armed forces are firing on evacuation columns trying to leave Mariupol for the territory of Ukraine free from the Russian occupation. Such actions of the Russian Federation are a clear violation of Geneva Conventions and international law, and we call upon the international community to take all necessary steps to hold Russia accountable for numerous crimes committed in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to pass the floor now to the delegation of the USA, and afterwards it will be followed by Hamdi via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Janice Helwig. I represent the U.S. Helsinki Commission in Congress. We are extremely concerned about the vulnerability to human trafficking of the more than 4 million refugees who have been forced to flee their country due to Russia's war on Ukraine and seek self safety elsewhere. I want to express enormous appreciation for the frontline states and other states that are welcoming and assisting this unprecedented influx of refugees. Chairman in Office Rao yesterday described the situation on the ground and the measures that Poland is taking, both to assist refugees and to prevent them from falling prey to traffickers. We want to support Poland and other frontline states in these efforts. 
As we've heard, some 90% of refugees are women and children. And there are reports already of traffickers trolling re refugee reception areas, train stations, as well as online in an attempt to lure vulnerable refugees with offers of housing or employment. The sheer number of refugees makes the situation daunting. In addition, many are children, including thousands of unaccompanied minors. There are people with disabilities, minorities, including Roma and other particularly vulnerable individuals. We must work together and support frontline and other states receiving refugees and protecting them from human trafficking. We appreciate EU efforts already underway and we would be also interested in discussing what role the OSE can play in this respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to pass the floor now to Hamdi. Uh, we will connect via Zoom and it will be followed by Soroptimis International of Europe they will connect also via Zoom. Thank you. Okay, if uh, Hamdi is not connected, then we will pass the floor to Soroptimis International of Europe. Thank you so much. More than a million people, mostly women with children, have fled from Ukraine by now. They are extremely vulnerable. They have lost almost all that made them feel safe and protected. Their husbands who had to stay behind, their friends and neighbors, their jobs, their cultural embedment. Many of them have traumatic war experiences. Coming to a safe country and receiving food and shelter is only a first relief. The future is more than uncertain for most of them, and it can be dangerous. These women, many of them pregnant or with small children who are tired and frightened, are easy proof for criminals. They are in fear of being robbed of the few belongings they still have and from being sexually assaulted. Criminals seek to traffic them into all types of exploitation. This is happening already, and it has to stop. We know of women being offered transport at the Ukrainian border, but are gratefully having accepted it, they ended up in forced labor or prostitutions. Others are relieved to find housing, only to discover that it entails domestic servitude or sexual services. This is trafficking in human beings. And it is a crime against humanity. It is banned by international treaties. Soroptimist International of Europe, through its maxim, we stand up for women, calls upon all Europeans to protect Ukrainian refugees from trafficking and from any other forms of crime, all victims of trafficking, to a large majority of them women, need our protection and our support. We sought optimists in Europe are ready to provide both. Sir Optimist clubs have already in the past been active to prevent trafficking and they have helped victims. In the present situation with millions of women at risk, our vigilance and our efforts will be multiplied. We are present in 43 countries, all Europe, Europe and the Middle East. In last COVID year, our members set up projects for over five and a half million euro, all of them helping women and girls to build a better life. So optimists have reinforced projects in this big wave of solidarity to reach out to women and girls in a vulnerable situation before they risk to become a victim. Thank you for these two minutes. Thank you very much uh, for your intervention. We will try to connect to uh, Hamdi again. I don't know if this works. Are you connected? If not, uh, then we will pass the floor to European Sex Workers Alliance. They should be connected via Zoom. Dear Excellences, dear guests, my name is Sabrina Sanchez, a woman with trans experience and the coordinator of the European Sex Worker Rights Alliance. 
a sex worker-led network with membership in 30 countries across Europe and Central Asia, and I'm very pleased to be joining you today. I came to Europe from Latin America in 2005. Although I was legally authorized to live and work in Spain after a few months, because of the significant barriers that prevent trans women from finding employment, I have been a sex worker since I arrived in Europe. It is amazing that trans individuals aren't recognized as a minority, given that our lives are one of the arguments for the Russian invasion too. Our community is very familiar with the concept of the ideal victim. Our grassroots experience of organizing for our human rights is that sex workers are seen as those who deserve punishment, detention, and deportation instead of rights and help. Unless we can perform a very limited definition of the ideal victim, who are considered to be only those victims of the worst forms of exploitation and trafficking. This has dangerous consequences, as my colleague migrant sex worker said, the only instance in which she would engage with police would be in extreme circumstance of immediate threat to her life. Globally, sex workers organize and develop structures and strategies to protect themselves from violent clients and to support themselves to work independently and free from exploitation. Our member organizations also play a vital role in preventing children from being forced into sex industry, as well as supporting those who have been trafficked into it. We are the only organizations that can build trust and bridge the gap between official anti-trafficking structures and stakeholders and the most marginalized people selling sex. Yet, we remain systematically excluded and silenced. The exclusion and silencing of certain groups of people is defined as institutional discrimination. As recognized by the UN agencies like UNDP, UN, UNAIDS, the World Health Organization, or UNFPA, or human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, and now more recently, the Belgian government. It is only through dialogue and partnership with the sex worker community and trafficking in persons that can be reduced and sex worker human rights concerns addressed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Now I would like to pass the floor to International Justice Organization. Uh, they should be connected via Zoom. Uh, we can still continue until 15.35, uh, but then it can only be continued without interpretation. So over to International Justice Organization. Уважаемые, уважаемые председательствующие, уважаемые участники конференции, когда речь идет о мигрантах и беженцах, усилия по идентификации часто уступают место борьбе с незаконным ввозом мигрантов или определению права мигрантов на получение убежища, о возможности предложить защиту и помощь тем, кто подвергается эксплуатации на миграционных маршрутах, упускаются, к сожалению. В большинстве своем женщины и дети могут стать жертвами торговцев людьми, во время транзита или по прибытии в пункт назначения. Поэтому системы защиты должны адаптивно, оперативно адаптироваться с учетом уязвимости людей, ищущих убежище от вооруженных конфликтов. В частности, сегодня, вы знаете, это с Украины. Мы наблюдаем большой поток беженцев с Украины на южной границе Соединенных Штатов. Мы организовали инициативную группу под названием International Justice Organization и встречаем беженцев с целью оказания помощи с жильем, питанием, помощь с переводом на прибеседе с офицерами на границе и, естественно, о существующих рисках торговли людьми. Потому что торговля людьми между США и Мексикой растет, так как все больше молодых женщин похищают или заманивают приграничные районы обещаниями луч лучшей жизни. По данным ФБР, Сан-Диего входит в число 13 худших регионов США с точки зрения торговли людьми жертвами которой ежегодно становятся примерно 8 тысяч человек. За последние несколько лет организованные преступные группы активизировали деятельность по торговле людьми, включая иммигрантов. Уже сегодня мы получаем огромное количество информации об исчезнувших людях, пересекающих границы по всему миру. В основном это женщины и дети. К ним подходят люди под видом добровольцев и уводят в неизвестном направлении. Хаос и беспорядок создают отличную почву для такого преступления, как торговля людьми. И резюмируя, хочу отметить, что все усилия по защите не должны оказываться под влиянием концепции, а так понимаемой, идеальной жертвы, 
как это обычно бывает, которая согласуется с установленными моделями идентификации и часто выявляемыми формами торговли людьми. Поэтому э, мы подходим к своей работе индивидуально в соответствии с потребностями и факторами уязвимости мигрантов на сегодняшний момент с Украины, ищущих убежище от вооруженного конфликта в Соединенных Штатах Америки. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to uh, go back to the question that we have uh, received from the, on behalf of the EU delegation. In, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, the interpreters, thank you very much, uh, Sasha. Uh, we will now work without interpretation. Thank you very much for the great job of the interpreters. Um, I would like to now go back uh, to the question that was uh, posed by the EU delegation regarding identification and detection of uh, victims of trafficking in uh, current mixed migration flows. If all the panelists could perhaps answer this question in one minute. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I think this is, remains a key challenge. Um, and I would say that one of the primary recommendations is routinized, routinized screenings by frontline responders at border points, um, which seems very straightforward, but that does require a lot of resources and capacities put into place in advance, which includes knowledge for the frontline workers, skills in interacting with vulnerable populations, uh, laws and procedures that give them the basis to conduct such screenings and appropriate infrastructure such as um, child-friendly spaces, family-friendly spaces, etc. Uh, also appropriate personnel. We do know that some vulnerable populations um, will not interact with, with men, uh, so having appropriate uh, women and diverse genders at border points is very important and has been highlighted also appropriate languages. Um, frontline responders need to be able to refer potential cases to specialized protection actors, ideally, if appropriate, on site. Um, but I believe that all of this should be informed by good contextual analysis, knowing in advance what the vulnerability factors are. I very much agree with my co-panelist who has noted that marginalized and minority populations are often most at risk. So understanding what minorities and marginalized populations are crossing borders uh, in advance will certainly uh, allow people to zero in on the populations that require uh, additional protection and screening. Thank you. Uh, just some words to, to add as an answer to this question. Uh, yes, this is uh, the most challenging step in the process of, of uh, fighting the uh, trafficking in human beings. And I will come to what I have mentioned in my, uh, my intervention at the beginning, that we have to uh, um, make all efforts for promoting the, the most important information to the population about the risks and also to invest a lot in the education for a personal safety. Uh, not less important is to make sure that the state is conducting the right uh, uh, and is implementing the right uh, gender equality policies. We have to work on um, on breaking gender stereotypes and this will help us in the process of the identification of the victims when uh, women uh, that was trafficked is afraid of uh, uh, saying about this because she will be punished by the family or she will be ex or she will be excluded from the community uh, uh, due to this she will never say that she is a victim of the traffic uh, also may happen to a man because the stereotype of the society is that a man is strong, always strong. When a man is uh, coming with the information that he was trafficked, the society has already some perception and bias regarding him. And this is, will be also a reason for excluding him. And that is why the process of identification is so difficult. So we have to think about legal instruments, but at the same time, we have to be very focused on improving the educational instruments and also the right in providing the right information to to the communities and to the population thank you i think one element i would add in response to the question is the importance to ensure that all are treated equally 
in relation to access to identi identif identification documents. Um, this is not always the case. I think we have to, to be honest about that. And yet that's central to issues of access to education, employment, and even food. Uh, so I think it is important, uh, in, even essential, to, make sh to ensure that there is access uh, to individuals who may be susceptible to human trafficking in appropriate languages as much as possible. Uh, here we are referring to the languages of minorities, and also that it be in a cultur culturally sensitive manner. And when we refer to access in, in, in the appropriate languages, it's not always or exclusively European languages. There are more individuals that actually are involved and in fleeing the conflict than, uh, than national minorities from Europe. And I think we tend to forget this, and this has to be part of the solution with the, the challenges that we are facing uh, currently. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. And I would also like to add from the perspective of the Office of the Special Representative and remind you about the uh, tool that is available and that we developed, that, that is the uniform guidelines on the identification and referral uh, of victims of trafficking and mixed migration flows, especially within the ref uh, reception framework. And uh, I would also like to stress that the information on what it means to be protected as a victim of trafficking is very important. Leaflets are not enough. We need to explain to every single person that uh, may be a presumed victim of trafficking what it means for them, what is there for them. And this is the, the issue of the language too, but not only the language they speak in, but also the language that would be plain, comprehensible and understandable. And just one point I would like to add that uh, all migrants should know information about organization who can help in country where they can go and we have a work. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear panelists. Uh, thank you so much, Katarina. Uh, we have a coffee break now and we will resume at 16.05 this time. Thank you.